Well, all right. Welcome to History 17 Bravo, your instructor today and tomorrow, at least till the end of the semester. It is uh, a topic that is briefly touched upon in your uh, readings this week in the phoner textbook, uh, Ludlow a Massacre. I want to spend a little bit more time upon that today. And so we are. Um, I want to talk about first, before we get into uh, what happened at Ludlow in Colorado, some patterns in history. Uh, historians have recognized uh, patterns uh, during a century of strikes, basically from the end of the Civil War to about World War II, strikes uh, go forward in a particular pattern. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. So in this picture that we have here, we have a beautiful plant uh, factory, so to speak. speak. Lots of things moving around, people working. Uh, everybody happy until something upsets the workers and they may or may not go on strike, but here it is. Here's, here's one of the things that we uh, have to understand is property rights. These workers uh, do not own the plant. Uh, the plant is probably not owned by any single person. It's more than likely owned by a group of people who have formed to pool their money and create a corporation. They might own shares in a particular company if the company is public. And the United States is all about property rights. And we've lear you've learned that last time you took History 17a. The Constitution uh, defines um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which is different than the Declaration of Independence, which was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No, in the Constitution, it is the pursuit of property. So property rights in the United States are sacrosanct. They are everything. They are what the fundamentals of our law are based upon, which creates a dilemma for workers. Because if they decide to go on strike, and if you look at them, if, if they all just sat down and said, we are going on strike, this is a sit-down strike, and there were such things, they are immediately trespassing on property they do not own. Now, someone in that picture, one of these workers, might have been there for 30, 35 years. They don't own it. They may feel that they've owned it. They've come to know it. They've it's become a part of who they are, part of their life and livelihood, but they have no rights to the property itself. It belongs to somebody else. So they have a dilemma. If they do a sit-down strike, they're, they're violating the law. If they leave the plant and they say, well, we're not going to come to work tomorrow and strike that way, there's no violation of the law. They're not hurting the property in any way. They're not preventing. Uh, uh, preventing. Okay, okay. So if they went on strike and went away, hey, a week's vacation, not paid, of course. Um, everything is fine. Nobody's breaking any law. But if they leave the plant and then prevent other workers, scabs, from coming in to work the plant, then they are breaking the law. They're not trespassing per se, but they're preventing others from fulfilling a contract. And so therefore, they are breaking contracts as a third party, which is illegal. And then you can toss in all sorts of other stuff. If they strike and surround the plant and try to prevent scab workers, uh, they might be in violation of uh, loitering, unlawful assembly perhaps even um, anything else that the court system can throw at them at the particular time. So strikers have a dilemma. They really don't want to go on strike. They don't. It's the last resort, usually. Owners have a dilemma, too. This plant is only a... It really exists as a entry in a logbook. And as long as there's numbers being produced in that particular ledger... Thing is, things are good. Uh, no numbers being produced, no production materials coming out, no sales at the end of the week. That's bad. Um, so owners have a dilemma as well. They want to see the factory 
operating, they want to see it working, they want to see uh, products being produced. Um, they don't want a slowdown, they don't want a strike, really. But they need to operate what they determine as cost effective, so they have to keep an eye on cost, they have to keep an eye on the products being produced by their competitors in a capitalistic market, and therefore uh, they have to keep a bottom line on how much they pay their employees, because employee costs are going to be the biggest expense out of this particular factory that we're looking at here or any factory anywhere. Employees cost money. And so if you can cut costs and have people come in and do the work for less, wouldn't you want that, right? So anyway, just know that there's particular dilemmas all the way around. And the one way that an owner can bring in workers during a strike, they can bring in what we call scabs. People who are working to break the strike, break the skin, bleed, you have scabs later on. This is something that neither the owner wants to do, usually, because it's an ethical dilemma. And especially if the owner lives in the same city as the factory itself, they have to get along with their workers. So bringing in scab workers, not sometimes the thing that they want to do. They want to feel safe walking the streets, kind of thing. So let's talk about some strike patterns. So let's say, uh-oh, there's a strike. You own that factory that we were just looking at. You're going to call the sheriff. Well, maybe not that one. But uh, you're going to call a sheriff like Andy over there. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a, a problem in that sheriffs are nearly always ineffectual when it comes to taking care of workers who have gone on strike. Mostly because sheriffs are local. They know most of the people working at that particular plant. They were friends with some of the people at that plant. They might have played football with some of the people in that plant. And because most sheriffs are uh, voted for, the way that they treat these workers who go on strikes may, in essence, see whether or not they're re-elected in the next cycle of elections. So there's a reason why a sheriff might not be the best uh, use, but they're going to call him anyway. And we saw this in the Homestead strike and Carnegie Steel Plant, Homestead, Pennsylvania. The first person that Andrew Carnegie's manager, Andrew Frick, called was a sheriff. I've got workers hanging around the, the, the fences of my property. Can you please disperse them? Well, the sheriff will go there and he will talk to them, but often his only resource is to talk to them and use reason to uh, with the employees to try and keep the peace. But that's all he's got. Especially in the case of Homestead, Pennsylvania, where over 1,400 workers went on strike. He's just one guy. In Ludlow, or Trinidad, over 13,000 coal miners went out on strike. How is one sheriff going to be effective? You know, see what I mean? So all he has is a voice. It's nearly always ineffectual. So you're a corporate owner, your factory, the sheriff doesn't do any good. You go to the next step, which is to call a private police force. If the sheriff can't do it, um, then I'm going to use my own cops. And they come in two forms. Um, particularly throughout history, we'll call the Pinkerton cops um, or the Baldwin Feltz detective agency. And they'll be used by corporate entities to lay down some smack. They'll bring clubs, mallets, and guns, uh, they're nearly very always brutal, um, looking for strikers, 
uh, jumping strikers, beating strikers up, sometimes even outright killing strikers. Uh, most of the Pinkerton cops or your Baldwin Feltz detective agencies are not from the local community, so they have no problem with bashing in heads. The problem with them is that they're very, 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 very expensive. So in the case of uh, Ludlow, where you had 13,000 hardened miners going out on strike, you're, you're not going to call just one guy or a group of guys. You need hundreds of private cops to come in and start knocking some heads. And they charge by the day. You pay them every day. The day you miss a payment, the day they leave. It's expensive. But the way that they're em employed, the way that they're put into force, is to make it so that the workers themselves, the strikers, who might be peace peaceful people, and in 99% of the time they are very peaceful, law-abiding, church-going citizens, what you will then see is these cops jumping people or killing a minor or two and people will retaliate now why would they want minors to get or any strikers to get violent why what's the purpose of that Well, it's so we can go to the next step in the pattern. You see, you've called the sheriff. He couldn't do anything. You call your Pinkerton cops or your Baldwin Feltz people. Uh, they come in, smash a few heads. The strikers start pushing back. You call the National Guard once your workers become violent. And we'll see this here pretty soon. So they, there they are. Now, the National Guard back then, in 1913, when Ludlow starts, it's, uh, it's a state militia. And to call up the state militia or the National Guard, you need a governor to, to, to do that. So you're a corporate owner. You've talked to the sheriff. He can't do anything. Your, your goons that you hire, your, your cops or, or your agents, um, they create trouble. Soon there's a little violence. Now you're going to call the governor to send in the militia. Once you do this, though, and the reason why, and here's the answer to the question, why you want to go to the strikers is so that you can transfer the cost off of your corporate ledgers to the state taxpayers. It costs a lot of money to have Pinkerton cops. Let's get rid of the Pinkerton cops, bring in the National Guard. Suddenly, I don't have to pay anybody anymore. The state picks up the tab. The state taxpayers are paying for the National Guard to... It, it could even be that the very people on, who are on strike have paid taxes to pay the National Guard to clear them very selves. Kind of strange irony of all things. Most of your National Guardsmen won't be local, most of them, uh, but your National Guardsmen or your state militia does have a problem with people defecting. So one out of every five National Guardsmen, and I've got five of them up there, do end up not following orders or running away or defecting to some extent. One out of five. It's crazy. Mainly because some of those people, one of those five, actually have high moral ethic standards. Maybe they don't feel like uh, attacking women, which is sometimes what you have to do to break a strike. Or or bashing heads in or outright killing people. That's not what they want to do. Or some strike breaker, they recognize, hey, that's Uncle Bob. I quit. You know, they might know some of these people as well. So if the strike continues and the National Guard doesn't do its job and things continue to get out of hand, you go to the next step where you pick up the phone and you call the President of the United States and say, can I please have the services of the U.S. Army or the Marine Corps? 
Now, a strike has to be pretty bad at this point in time where a president would have to intervene. But it's part of the, the pattern. And it relieves the state of any fiduciary uh, compensations to the people that are breaking up the strike. Um, and it transfers that to uh, taxpayers of the nation. Again, a corporate a corporation doesn't have to pay for the Army or the Marine Corps to come in and do what the Army and the Marine Corps does to people who are on strike. This is just patterns pointing out a little bit here. They're definitely not local. Uh, there's usually no defectors whatsoever because there's such a thing as military discipline. Uh, but they do have a tendency to use toys. Tanks, Gatling guns, machine guns, Tommy guns, whatever devices happen to be handy, they'll use them. They have no qualms about using this sort of stuff. Okay, so let's review for for a second here. I'm going to throw uh, a, a question at you. You have a strike going on um, throughout this hundred year period between the end of the Civil War and maybe the end of uh, World War II. If there's a strike. At what point of this phone calling chain, uh, what phase does it settle at? The majority of strikes are settled at what phase? Is it the phase where the corporate owners call a sheriff, private cops like the Pinkertons, the National Guard, or state militia, or is it when they call the Army or the Marines? When are most strikes settled, I guess? At what phase? Oh, I gotta play the music. <laughs> I hate that song. All right, uh, if you answered A, the sheriff phase, you would be correct. Most strikes are very short, usually a day or two, three, four tops. You don't bring the private cops in until like a week goes by, maybe more. And then the National Guard, maybe a month or two in, and then the Marines when all hell breaks loose. Okay, But most most like 90 to 95 percent of all union stoppages or strikes non-union or union strikes are are, are completed or, or or they end at the sheriff phase so it's part of the patterns i want to show you ludlow's different is going to go all the way to the delta but we'll show that another pattern in strikes that most people do not realize is that women and children are on the front lines because in 1913 okay women worked children worked there were no child labor laws really it was just getting started and so children have gone on strike they have women definitely have gone on strike but children too will refuse to work for more money or for better conditions. So what I'm saying is that yes, women work, yes, children work, families work, families sometimes go on strike. And this is the strike pattern so that when you see um, cops charging a crowd or the Marine Corps or the National Guards or Pinkerton private policemen charging into a crowd, know that there are women and children in those crowds almost always. So that's enough about strike patterns, I think. I want to talk about some errors in history, um, and I hope you bear with me for a little bit second. There's a little divergence on my part, but um, I think there is an error in methodology in history. In other words, the way that we gather history or understand why people or society make certain decisions. I think there's a huge error in history today. And it's it's reflective in the way that we teach history because of the method, methodology errors. And they have to do with something I call the dailies. It's the daily what? The daily life that we all lead. Every day I say hello to somebody, I say goodbye to somebody, I have a conversation with somebody, unless I'm really sick, um, and usually I have a, some sort of transaction somewhere. Every single day. So I have a daily life where hellos and goodbyes, conversations, transactions are all going. And it's all done within daily mores or daily um, values, daily culture. And I surround myself every single day with 
Well, peers, friends, relatives, people I hang with, we have very similar ideas, very similar values, similar culture, similar lives. We say hello, goodbye, conversations, transactions with almost the same sort of people almost every single day. It's a routine. And we end up hanging out with people who have the same values. We're more comfortable with people who reciprocate our mores, our standard of life, our culture. We're uncomfortable when we're put in a situation where people are very different from us. And we're the only one. And I think it's an era in history that we don't face this particular uh, topic. So, um, I know you're booing right now. Uh, listen, Justin Bieber has dailies, right? He has a life. He does. He says hello to people. He says goodbye to people. He has conversations with people. He conducts transactions every single day. And he surrounds himself with peers, with people that he knows that reciprocate the same values that he has, that reinforce his culture, his standards, his mores. And the same thing can be said with Chuck D from Public Enemy. Chuck D has friends and peers that he surrounds himself that reflect his values, his culture, his standards and mores. He says hello, goodbye, has conversations, conducts transactions, just like Justin. Now this is not to say that Chuck D knows Justin or Justin knows Chuck D. The two are probably very, very different people. But that's based on the cultures and the values and the peers that they hang with. And I think the type of music that Chuck D puts out with Public Enemy is very much shaped by the culture, the values, and the mores of the people he hangs around with. And the same thing with Justin. See what I'm saying? And we need to address this in history because it happens in history too. The people that we read about in history books, they say hello and goodbye every single day of their past lives. They had past conversations, transactions, and they usually hung out with people who reinforced their values and culture and their standards and more. So like these two right here have dailies. Over on the left is John D. Rockefeller Jr. Son of a very wealthy dad. And I'm sure he went to some of the best schools, hung out with some of the most educated people in America because he went to the best schools, was taught certain values, and he was to act in certain ways. And when a strike happens to a company that he happens to own, the people that are surrounding him will shape the decisions that he makes. And the same with the woman over to the right. Her name is Mary Harris Jones, otherwise known as Mother Jones. And she too has a past that has shaped her. Past hellos and goodbyes and conversations and transactions, and she probably hangs around with a group of people that reinforce who she is. And so the decisions that she makes is shaped by those people as much as they are her own. And Mother Jones is very, very different than John D. Rockefeller Jr. That's all I'm saying as we go forward into this. This is a map of where the trouble is. It's south on Highway 25, south of Grand Junction as you're heading towards New Mexico in a little town called Trinidad. And just to the west of Trinidad are the Rocky Mountains. To the east of Trinidad is the Great Plains. Right at the foothills of the Rockies, right around uh, elevation 5,200 feet, somewhere in there, kind of like Denver. The Mile High Town. But right in these mountains, just to the north and west of Trinidad, are some huge deposits of coal. And 
As I go through this list, I want to refer back to the dailies about this particular coal. Now, one of the daily realities in 1913 was that for every thousand miners that went to work every year, 3.2 of them will not come back. That's the danger quotient for miners in the year 1913. That 3.2 miners will die every year for every thousand workers. That's pretty high, actually in my opinion I'm not sure I would want that job that's playing the odds right I think somewhere in there um, however the mines in the Trinidad region near Ludlow uh, were double that average 7.6 deaths for every 1,000 workers double the national average. The, the mines in and around Trinidad were notoriously unsafe. They've operated unsafe for decades. This is something to bear in mind. That a worker who went to work knew that he was working perhaps in the single most unsafe mining district in the country. Think about that. At the end of the day, I want to see my wife. I want to be rewarded with my children. But I don't know if that's going to happen if I go to work. And the thing with the, the Ludlow miners is there were 13,000 of them. Nearly every day the miners went to work and somebody died or more than one or two or three, seven point six out of a thousand. These were very dangerous conditions. What they were mining was something called uh, bituminous coal. And this particular breed of coal is actually called, uh, has a nickname, coke, C-O-K-E, coke coal. Now coke coal was very much in demand because it had very few impurities in it. It was almost what they called clean coal, which is, sounds like an oxymoron, uh, but it was clean in the sense that it didn't have other mineral deposits or other impurities in it. And because it was almost pure 100 cent block of carbon coal, um, it was highly sought after by people like Andrew Carnegie, who made steel. And part of the steel making process was to get a hold of almost pure coal, bituminous coal. The company that founded the mines since 1880 was known as the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, CF&I. CF&I definitely sold coke coal to Andrew Carnegie so he could make his steel. So this is kind of where we're at in, in background. Now, John D. Rockefeller acquired the company, CF&I, in the year 1903. This is the John D. Rockefeller that created the monopoly known as Standard Oil Company. Uh, now we know Standard Oil Company as uh, the split-offs because the U.S. government came in and busted them into several different uh, um, uh, corp oil corporations, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, Shell, Texaco, uh, all of them used to be one company called Standard Oil owned by John D. Rockefeller. He acquires Colorado Fuel and Iron Company that has been around since 1880. He acquires it in 1903. He gifts it to his son for Christmas. Here son, I bought you a coal company. Merry Christmas. Thanks dad. The thing about John D. Rockefeller Jr. is he was headquartered in New York City. It was given to him in 1903. The strike is going to start in 1913. John D. Rockefeller Jr. had never been to Trinidad, Colorado. Had never gone to see the gift his dad gave him. For John D. Rockefeller Jr., the CF&I company that his dad gave him was nothing more than an abstract a line entry on a ledger sheet. 
that had a number attached to it. A number that indicated whether it was making money or not. That's all John D. Rockefeller Jr. really cared about from New York City. Well, let's talk about that 1903 purchase because it's kind of interesting. There's Dad up on the top, Big Dad, Big John D. There's the son, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And the CF and I uh, coal mines went on strike in 1903. The owners of CF and I finally had it. They put up the company for sale, as they told their striking employees they would, and sold it pretty cheap. John D. Rockefeller was able to buy it on the cheap compared to what other coal companies were going for the going rate. Anyway, um, Rockefeller puts an ad in a New York newspaper where there's a whole bunch of new immigrants, and he's going to start hiring someone, to, uh, hiring some of them to be transported to Colorado to break the strike. He's hiring scab workers. Most of these workers, though, don't come from the West. They don't come from the United States, they don't come from Canada, they don't come from Western Europe. They come from the South and East of Europe. And further, um, John D. Rockefeller will hire um, as many disparate languages that he can find. So you're going to have at the CF&I mines in Colorado 24 distinct languages between the years 1903 and 1913. He's going to hire Greeks, he's going to hire Romanians, Italians, Poles, Czechs, uh, he's going to hire Russians, Latvians, Estonians, Swedes, he's going to hire uh, people from Turkey, uh, people from Iran, people from everywhere that he can think of all sorts of disparate languages. Why? So they don't talk to each other. And if they can't talk to each other, they can't possibly agree ever to go on strike. Uh, that's the theory. Anyway, some of the problems, though, at the CF&I strike, uh, and the reason, uh, some of the problems at CF&I mines had to do with the way they were paid. Uh, many of these guys are paid by the ton. For every ton they pull out of the mine, uh, every ton of coal that they pull out of the mine, they're going to get a paycheck. Uh, but they're not paid for something called dead work. Dead work is the kind of work where you're creating safety. So you're not actually working on pulling coal out of the mines, but you are working on creating reinforcement timbers, bracing the walls, making sure that there's no cave-ins, putting in a ventilation system to pump out any natural gas or methane that might be building up, uh, putting in water pumps, in case the rains or floods or something, uh, making sure all you, you don't get paid for that. Yeah, it would make the mine much safer if you did all of those things. So just keep in mind uh, that workers are not being paid for this dead work, and this is the reason why one of the reasons why these mines are in, are twice the national rate. So in September of 1913, 90% of the 13,000 strike uh, workers vote to go on strike. Overwhelmingly call uh, call for strike. Conditions are that unsafe. They have seven demands, and I'm going to list them here because they're pretty quick, and I don't think they're all that big. First demand to the uh, managers at CF&I, and therefore to John D. Rockefeller way back in New York City. Hey, John, we want you to recognize the United Mine Workers of America. That's the name of our union. We want you to recognize it. Uh, seven, uh, demand number two, uh, increase our wages by 10%, please. Uh, demand number three, we want an eight-hour workday. We don't want to have a workday uh, that goes beyond 10 hours or 12 hours. Those things are ridiculous for us. The other thing we would like to see is payment for dead work. So all that safety stuff, that installation that we need, um, we 
want to make sure that we're paid for creating safety in the mines. Uh, we want to be able to hire our own check weighman. Here's because the check weighman was a company run. It was the company that hired the check weighman. That when you bring the coal out, who weighs the coal? The check weighman weighs the coal. Well, if the corporation hires the check weighman, he's going to go by round down instead of round up, right? So they wanted to vote for their check weighman. Uh, the other thing about the CF&I mines is most of those mines were operated in areas very remote. And so you had compounds, basically. And not only were they compounds, but they were fenced in compounds with one entrance or two at the most, guarded, and you couldn't leave without permission, often. So you had no choice. Even though your family was there, you had to go to the company store to buy your goods. You had to use whatever housing that the company provided. In the doctors that they provided, even the churches, were Protestant churches to most of the people who were from Eastern or Southern Europe. So they were mostly Catholic or Orthodox. So this created a problem for many of the workers at that point in time. And the last demand, follow the Colorado mining laws. There were mining laws in the books. C, F, and I was not following them. That's it. These are the seven demands. I don't think they're that terribly intransigent, uh, but they're evicted. Uh, as soon as John D. Rockefeller hears about it, uh, they're going to be kicked out of houses like this that you see off to the right. Uh, and an interesting thing about these shacks is there's rows and rows and rows of them. Whether you were just a married couple or a married couple with five kids, you still got the same size shack. So that's weird. Um, but the United Mine Workers of America came prepared. They leased or purchased lands that surrounded the mining company property. And not only that, they invited the press to come in with them to make sure that um, uh, the reason to invite the press wasn't to protect the workers. The reason to invite the press was because this particular strike was known that it was going to be pretty long, pretty brutal, and they wanted the press along to win public opinion. They also invited Mother Jones. A little bit more about her, Mary Harris Jones, who we saw just before. And they're going to set up tent colonies in and around this region and this area. And Ludlow, just so you know, is just one among dozens of tent colonies stretched along a huge swath, maybe about a hundred miles long, uh, against the Rockies, taking coal, bituminous coal, out for CF and I. Uh, and this is what a particular tent colony is going to look like, at least in September of 1913. So from New York City, you're going to have this man, John D. Rockefeller, start to be pressured by the people that he hangs around with, by the people that form his decision-making sphere. All those dailies that he's been having, the peer group that he has. John, what are you going to do with these strikers? What are your values, man? Well, his values are towards the bottom line, towards the pure capitalistic approach. And he's going to start to, from New York City, hire scabs. He's going to hire the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency because the sheriff in Trinidad, Colorado, is one guy, and there's 13,000 miners. Um, I'm the sheriff. I can't do nothing. These miners are great. I like them. I have pie with them. Sorry. So he's got no choice. Um, he's going to hire the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. John D. Rockefeller Jr. has to open up his wallet to pay the very people that you see here in this picture. These are uh, the one thing about the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency is they specialize. They, they advertise themselves as specialists 
who will break minor strikes. They know minors. They know how to get inside their heads. And here's an armored car, one of the first armored cars ever developed. Here again is 1913. Uh, a couple interesting things about this particular armored car. Uh, you can see a machine gun that is mounted on the back. Uh, and then you have the driver here, and then in the front they have a big huge headlight, spotlight, that swivels. Um, and they're going to use this armored car, they call it the Deathmobile, and uh, they're very proud of it at the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, and they're going to use it right away once they start arriving uh, in the t outside of the tent colonies uh, near Trinidad, uh, tent colonies such as, as Ludlow. And so what you'll see these guys do is they're going to set up these spotlights that you see. And so at night, they're going to um, turn on all the spotlights that they can and, and roam over the tents and try and keep the miners awake and the miners' families awake that are living in these tent colonies. Um, they're going to fire their machine guns into the tent colonies indiscriminately. Uh, and any of their guns, sometimes they'll fire over, sometimes they'll fire into. It doesn't matter with these guys. Their job is to goad on these miners and make the miners violent. Uh, so they're going to do everything that they can think of. Jumping miners, um, ganging up on miners that might be drifting off alone. Um, there's stories where um, at Ludlow couple of Baldwin Feltz guys will take some shots from 500 yards away. They'll make a bet as to whether or not they can hit that guy 500 yards away walking across the compound. Um, and, you know, we'll see who can come the closest. So this is kind of what what they do, and it works. The miners get angry. The miners uh, start to shoot back at the Baldwin Feltz guys. They, a couple of miners will maybe jump a Baldwin Feltz guys, and the Baldwin Feltz guys are trained to take punches. That's what they do. Anyway, it works. So you'll have a, a tent colony like this, where you'll see uh, women and children um, that are getting fired upon with real bullets and machine guns, and the men in the company will start to defend their women defend their children and will arm themselves and start to shoot back kind of thing. Add to this that winter is coming. Close up there. And Miner's life's a tough life. This is this is over 5,000 feet at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The coming of winter, you're being shot at, you're living in these tents, you don't get any sleep. This is tough. Once the miners start fighting back, it's October of 1913 at this time, uh, you're going to see uh, John D. Rockefeller reach for the phone, and he's going to call Elias Ammons. Elias Ammons is the governor of Colorado. He is the one that can say yay or nay to calling up the National Guard, which they arrive in late October. Uh, and set up camp uh, right away. Now one of the, uh, well, the general of the National Guard unit or the state militia is a guy by the name of Dr. John Chase. He's an ophthalmologist out of the city of Denver, just up the road. Uh, Mother Jones described uh, General John Chase as someone who has ice in his veins. Um, interesting. Uh, but the workers cheered when he arrived and gave him a song and, and threw their hats in the air and it was definite cheer when John Chase arrives because they thought that John Chase and the National Guard came to defend them from the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. And calm did prevail for about a week until General John Chase, at about the 2nd, 3rd of November, declared martial law 
on all that area near Trinidad, Colorado. He suspended habeas corpus, started to make huge amounts of arrests, 400 the first day, 500 the second day, um, and then he began to torture to gain information from some of the people that he had arrested. Hmm. What's interesting about this is, of course, he doesn't have the authority to do this. The only people that can declare martial law is the governor, and the suspension of habeas corpus actually has to come from the feds. So he has no authority in all this, but he does it anyway, which is something interesting. And I want to bring up Mother Jones, because she is part of this Ludlow story. Very much so. She arrives... Uh, in Trinidad, Colorado uh, in December of 1913 to give her support to the striking miners and their families. Now a little bit about Mother Jones. Her real name is Mary Harris. Uh, she was born in Ireland, uh, the south of Ireland in a city called Cork. Uh, she parents were very poor. They moved to Canada, uh, but when she was just uh, 12, 11 or 12, they moved her to the United States. Um, in just before the Civil War erupted, she met a man in Memphis, Tennessee, by the name of George Jones, who happened to be a union member, the National Union of Iron Molders. And I put Antebellum there because it's before the Civil War. Unions before the Civil War existed, but they were rare. And they were even rarer in the South. So here she met a Union man in the South. What tragedy strikes uh, Mary Harris, though, uh, in 1867, a couple years after the Civil War, there was a huge outbreak of yellow fever. She lost all four of her children, and the oldest was five, uh, and her husband in a matter of two days. Her entire family was taken from her through this yellow fever outbreak in Memphis, Tennessee. But because she was the wife of a union member, the National Union of Iron Molders managed to raise some money for her on her behalf, and so she had a tidy little sum, and she went to Chicago, where she opened up her own shop um, and produced garments, and had her own employees, and things were looking good for a while until the Ch Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which burned down at least a quarter of Chicago, if not more. And, of course, her shop was in the path of that great fire. It burned to the ground. She is a widow. She is childless. She is broke. And the only one that would give her a break in the greater area known as Chicago was a new union forming up called the Knights of Labor. They actually hired her to cook for a while, and then pretty soon she was working the books and working full-time for the Knights of Labor. She was there in Chicago during the rail strikes of 1877. She was in Chicago during the Haymarket Riot of 1886. Now, her role in the uh, Ludlow massacre or the strike that took place was that when she arrived in uh, Trinidad in December of 1913 she was promptly arrested by General John Chase who put her on a train and expelled her from Colorado and personally gave her the orders do not come back. Well you're talking to one of the most dangerous women in America at that time. Um, that's what John Chase said of her later. Uh, she was, in his estimation, one of the most dangerous women in America, and she did exactly what he didn't want her to do. She came back um, and was arrested again by John Chase. Very public arrest. Many people saw it. She was kind of roughed up a little bit. Uh, they threw her in jail and put her into solitary confinement. Uh, John Chase was very bellicose about that. No one will go in to see her. Nobody, no how, not even a doctor. Uh, it gets out in the press, um, and then all heck breaks loose. Uh, demonstrations will erupt in February of 1914 in Trinidad. Uh, and that's what you see to the right. 
uh, women come from all across the United States, uh, particularly Denver uh, and Grand Junction, Colorado, but also uh, as far away as Dallas, Texas, and and uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ten thousand women, it is estimated, will go on strike. Uh, not go on strike, but will demonstrate in front of John Chase's uh, uh, headquarters in Trinidad and demanding that he let Mother Jones go. So there's this role. By uh, April of 1914, as the snows start to melt, um, we have uh, um, uh, a problem for the CF&I company. Um, and the problem is that they're losing the public relations war. All the bad press against John Chase and the Colorado militia and the State Guard uh, is, is not doing them very well. They're being vilified in the press. Particularly being vilified, who became America's new villain with John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and tensions were running high because of this vilification. Uh, half the state of Colorado can no longer afford to keep the National Guard in place, so they pull half the regiments out in April of 1914. But what will happen is that there will be volunteers that are basically, or were, former guardsmen for CF&I or former guards or former uh, Feltz detective agency cops. And so you've got a pretty hard bunch in 1914 that are wearing state militia uniforms that are being vilified and they've been there for months, at least five. And they're not a happy group. And tensions were high. The miners are so used to being shot at on a daily basis, they almost to a T, to a man, will arm themselves. And so this is what happens when on the morning of the 20th of April, 1914, a beautiful sunny day, it was also the Greek Easter day, when Greeks, uh, um, immigrants were celebrating Easter. Many of the Ludlow families were dressed in their best, whether they were Greek or not, and they were all getting ready to celebrate uh, or just finish celebrating morning mass. When machine gun fire erupted outside of the tent colony in Ludlow, and families scrambled for cover. Once inside their tents, with machine gun fire still raining down upon them, uh, many of these families had dug holes in their tents, places that they could go to get out of the way of gunfire. That's how much gunfire they had received over time. So women, children, men um, are realizing that this assault is unusual because the gunfire just keeps coming. A group of men will grab some guns and make a break for it for a small um, sh uh, communication shack about a half a mile away. And they'll put up a fight there, trying to draw the fire of the National Guardsmen their, their way so that the women and the children can make an escape. Right now they're trapped in their tents. Now while this gunfire is going on, uh, one interesting story is that a train engineer um, saw that these people were being fired upon and put his train in between the National Guardsmen and the tent colony. And the National Guardsmen, well, you know, these are Gatling guns. These are big, heavy things. You can't just move them. They're, they weigh hundreds of pounds. Um, and asking him to move, and he just parked the train engine, shut it down, and walked away. It gave enough time for women and children, many of them, to at least begin the process of escaping. Once that happened, though, um, 
the National Guardsmen, or many of them, uh, ran towards the tent colony with kerosene and just lit the place up. Needless to say, many of the miners were shocked. Most of America, when the news was released uh, about what happened, um, and again, remember that many journalists were embedded uh, with these people at Ludlow and many tent colonies around, so word got out pretty quick. And there was just a general feeling of shock throughout uh, America. Nineteen. Um, people were killed, maybe 22, it depends on who you ask, and how those other three were killed uh, is another story. Um, but the fact of the matter is that 11 children and two women were killed pretty much in that foxhole that you see over there to the left, where they were asphyxiated by the fire. A funeral procession occurred uh, a couple days later. It was said to have stretched for nearly four miles. Remember, there's 13,000 miners in this area, and almost every single one of them came out for this funeral. And here they're walking the streets of Trinidad, Colorado, getting ready to bury the dead. At the end of the line, it was said, at the end of the funeral procession lines, it, the, the myth is that uh, someone was handing out rifles and shotguns. Uh, thousands of miners take up arms after the funeral. Uh, CF&I property uh, is targeted, definitely. Company men are, are targeted and attacked. Um, and so here is the entrance to the Forbes mine which is uh, at the foothills of the of the chocolate mountains in the area and so you see uh, a foundation that has been well, used to uh, you only see a foundation you don't see the building that used to sit on it's been burned to the ground um, they there's a mine entrance there that's been blasted with dynamite so you can't enter it anymore um, things get so out of hand quickly uh, CF and I guards are targeted and murdered um, Hundreds of people are, are are injured. Hospitals are filling up quickly, as are uh, pine boxes. And so you're going to see a phone call, as per our pattern, from John D. Rockefeller to the new president at the time, Woodrow Wilson. Actually, that should say uh, October of 1914. I don't know why I got that date wrong. But anyway... Um, Woodrow Wilson will send in the cavalry. This is the 11th U.S. Cavalry out of Kansas. Uh, they show up. Uh, this is a train ride heading towards Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, the boys take a moment to take a stunning photo. Hey, they're a happy group. Um, it will take, however, 10 days of some pretty hard fighting uh, for the cavalry to restore order. 10 days. Um, the strike will continue on seven months more, uh, but what happens is the UMWA will run out of money, and the workers will not be successful in their strike bid. In fact, 408 of the 13,000 that went on strike will be arrested, 322 on murder charges. According to Howard Zinn, ace historian extraordinaire, 122 total lost their lives during that 10 days. That's in addition to the 19 and the 22 that were murdered um, during the Ludlow massacre. Uh, as for the National Guard, 10 officers and 12 enlisted men will be court-martialed, um, but every single one of them are exonerated. 
And going back to those that were put on murder charges, uh, every single one of them, um, none of them will, it will it, none of them will have it stick. Um, it takes a couple years for those that are on murder charges to be released, though. They actually spend some time in prison. Whereas the National Guardsmen, only 22 are court-martialed, and none of them get a slap on the wrist or anything. The fallout from the Ludlow Massacre is huge. Um, corporate America is is not looking good in the eyes of many Americans. Uh, many more strikes are popping up everywhere. And this is when Europe is in war. And this is when America wants to supply Europeans with the weapons of war. The last thing America wants are strikes. Um, and the biggest villain of them all is John D. Rockefeller. He's a villain among the people. But he's also being called a villain by his peers. The people that have reciprocated with him on his cultural mores in his daily life. That he's got to fix this somehow. And so he's going to pick up the phone and try and correct it. So who does John D. Rockefeller Jr. call to stop being a villain? If you said Mother Jones, you are right. Um, in 1915, he will meet with Mother Jones for a couple of days in his headquarters in New York City and coming out of that meeting is particularly interesting because Mother Jones had convinced John D. Rockefeller Jr. to recognize the UMWA. Uh, in fact, Mother Jones convinces John D. Rockefeller to create the safest mines in the entire United States. And the Rockefeller family becomes very politically involved in America after World War I, and they will write legislation, not only in the state of Colorado, but throughout the United States, some of the most toughest safety laws in the world, basically coming out of Ludlow and the conversation that John D. Rockefeller had with, it was a public relations stunt, but he really changed his tune after talking with Mother Jones. Maybe she is indeed the most dangerous woman in America. This is the memorial right outside of Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, and it's basically to the women and children who lost their lives in freedom, freedom's cause, at Ludlow, Colorado, April 20th, 1914. It was vandalized, I think, in 2003. It's been rededicated now in 2009. But this gets us to the question is, how do we remember this? How many of you even knew about this? We are in an era, ladies and gentlemen, where being a member of, the, of a union is frowned upon. When I was born, and I'm, not, I'm giving away my age here, 1962, I'm 50 years old. Listen, in 1962, one out of every four Americans was a union member, 25%. Three, 26% of Americans belong to a union. Today, it's around 4%. We have a, a, a win in Colorado, no, in Wisconsin, against um, the governor who came in, Scott Walker, who immediately set upon the union's the Public Employees Union. Huge hullabaloo. In case you missed it, Scott Walker was recalled. Had to go through a recall election. And, he, and, he, and Wisconsin, one of the most progressive states out of the progressive era that you're reading about right now, that, def that defended union workers, that's a history of union uh, support, actually upheld the election of, of Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin. To be a member of a union today is not a good thing. So how do we remember this? If, if union membership is fading, people don't remember what these unions gave to you. They gave to you the eight-hour day. Vacation time that's paid. These people gave their lives. These children gave their lives.